Good morning, everybody. We're looking now at John's Gospel, chapter 4. John's Gospel, chapter 4. And I have a lot of scripture to read to you because one story, and I want to read the entire story. I'm going to try really hard not to read fast. I got that impulse, you know, to, to get it read and get into the message. It don't have the time I would like to have. So here we are in verse 1 of John's Gospel, chapter 4. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who, was, who baptized, but his disciples. Let me stop there for a little bit of commentary. The, the, the Pharisees and Jewish leaders are trying to play John the Baptist and Jesus off against each other. Uh, and so Jesus' ministry he was growing, and they said, oh, now he's bigger than John the Baptist. And Jesus didn't like this. He didn't want this because... He had a, a, a ministry, a path laid out for him by God. He knew when his crucifixion was going to happen. And it, it was not going to be up to other people. He didn't want anybody else to pressure him and push him along. So he decided, I mean, how many people would do this? Would give up the fame and the popularity. So he decided to leave Judea where he was getting very popular, go back up to Galilee in the north to continue his ministry. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, the plot of ground that, that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? Is it also his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whatever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And either water I give them will, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come here to, to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I think she gulped right then. I had no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one who's speaking to you, am he. Jesus had a had to. Now, we've already talked about this some, and it's a thread that runs throughout John's gospel. Re remember, he said, as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that he could draw all men to himself. He was talking about the cross. And, and must and had to are the same idea. Do you get this? The same concept. He talks about it also in John's Gospel, chapter 12, which I quote to you often as I go through John's Gospel because it's a very important concept or idea. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 12, Now my hour has come. What shall I say? That God take me from this hour? No, for this hour, for this reason, I came into the world. What he was saying was that God had a plan for him for death on the cross, the time came for him to die, and Jesus had been living his whole life for that moment. Jesus had a very strong mustness about his ministry. He had a strong had to. And so we come to this story, and it says he had to go through Samaria. Now, I want you to picture ancient Israel. 
Judea is in the south, Galilee is in, in the north, and the, the country is kind of in a C shape. And in the middle of that C is Samaria. You don't have to go through Samaria to get to Galilee from Judea or vice versa. You could take a different route to get around. But Jesus, he said, I got to go through Samaria. I have to go through. I can go some other place, but I got to go through Samaria. And that was something you would not hear a Jew say. Jews avoided Samaria because they considered the Samaritans to be an inferior people. Now listen, don't be too critical of our Jewish friends because, you know, racism and bigotry is a human sin. And ever since Adam, we have had to fight this sin. And the Jews were, well, they gave in to it. And what happened was 700 years before there was a war, and I won't go through all the details, but because of that war, the Jews who were left behind after the war intermarried with pagans, and the result were the Samaritans. And that was the area that they lived in called Samaria. And so the Jews of Jesus' day considered them half-breeds and looked down on them. And they took pagan religion and they combined it with Judaism so the religion was not pure. So the Jews thought, this is the actual truth, that they were lower than dogs. Now, for you, a dog's a pet. In Jesus' day, Jews thought that dogs were unclean and they were wild animals roaming the street. Samaritans are even worse than dogs. It was strange that any Jew would say, I want to go through Samaria, but Jesus did. In fact, not only did he do it, but he said, I have to go through Samaria. There's one little more part of this, and that is that um, Jesus was both God and man. That's called the incarnation. We studied this some a few weeks ago. And because of the incarnation, we sometimes emphasize the God part of Jesus, but he was fully human as well. When he got to Samaria, when he got to Sychar, he was hungry and thirsty and tired. You and I would have taken a nap underneath the shade tree. But when he saw this woman, when she came down to the well, and I want you to get this, because he had to, he had to for that woman. He knew her before he even met her. Knew everything about her. And we're going to see next week, he also came because when she went to that town of Sychar and witnessed about her experience with Jesus, he got a chance to reach the entire town of Samaritans. So Jesus, even though he was hungry and thirsty, he knew why he was there. And rather than rest, he was reinvigorated so he could talk to this woman. Jesus had to go through Samaria because that was his mission, that was his purpose. Now, a few weeks ago, it was a large wasp nest in the eave underneath our garage. Our house is kind of tall, up, up in the air. So this was not the second floor, but it was kind of like a, a floor and a half up. So it's pretty far up in the air. This wasp nest is very large, and I was thinking about the danger. It was for my grandkids, and I didn't want them to be bitten. So uh, I got this special spray with a nozzle on it, and it could go 20 feet up in the air, and I got that nest really good. It said kills on contact. I looked, some of the wasps were like this. And that's called a kill on contact. Well, a few days later, I come back, and I saw some wasps flying around the nest. It turns out that some of them had not been there when I had sprayed. They were off doing whatever wasps do. And so they were trying to repair the nest and reconstruct what they had lost. I said, well, this won't do. So I got a long pole that we use to unscrew lights up on the second floor. And I took that pole, and I knocked the wasp nest down. And then I yelled to Debbie, Run! <laughs> she ran into the garage. I ran from the back of the house to the front of the house, well over 100 feet away from the wasp nest, and I'm standing there, and a wasp from that nest bit me my little finger. I still have a mark there. I can see the mark where the wasp bit me. I don't know if you've ever been bit by a wasp. It's like being shocked by an electric current. Oh! Now, I'm the kind of person, or I don't know why, when I get hurt, maybe it's because of sports, when I play ball. When I get hurt, I laugh. So I started going, ho, 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 oh, ho, oh. That wasp got me really good. Now, I'm telling you the story for a reason. This wasp, all wasps have a had to. They have to protect their nest. They have to protect their colony. It's written into the genetic code. And when I threatened that nest, when I knocked it down, that wasp had to protect all the things that were precious to her, it is a female, to her, 
and she had to come for her enemy. She may have seen me and followed me around the corner of the house so she could get me in particular because I knocked her house down. This is the way it is. I have a had to. She had to do it. But there's a difference between Jesus and the wasp. It's in her genetic code. But Jesus chose. This is what he wanted to do. He wanted to go to the cross because that was his mission. And for the joy set before him, as Hebrews says, and for the joy set before him, he endured his suffering and shame so that he could save people like you and me. That's why he came. That's what he was all about. That was his had to. He chose it. Nobody put it on him. He did it willingly because... That was his whole purpose. Now my hour has come. What should I say, Father, take me from this hour? No, for this reason I came into the world. He had a had to, and that had to was about you. It's about you. And here's what you should get from this. Drank the living water. Drank it. Just like Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Drank the living water. And I got a little joke, just a little joke, a little tiny joke, I tell you. Little jokes don't get little laughs. I understand that. This guy applies for a job. He's been interviewed by the boss. And the last, last question the boss asks, and this has happened to me, and I don't know how to answer this question when they ask. I never have figured it out. What is your greatest weakness? <laughs> I'm a sinner. Well, I, I know I can say that, I guess, but what's your greatest weakness? And the guy, and the guy says, well, I'm just a, a brutally honest person. And the boss says, I'm not sure that's a weakness. That's, a, that's kind of a, of a strength. And the man says, who cares what you think? So you come to church today, and this guy stands on the platform, maybe you don't even know me, you know, and he tells me I had to drink the living water, and you say to yourself, who cares what he thinks? Well, I, I'm just speaking the words that Jesus said. When he said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again, when he said to the woman at the well, you must drink the living water, he was giving you the secret, the essence, the truth about life, and you need to hear what Jesus had to say. So he, he's, he's thirsty, and he asks this woman for a drink. And she's surprised because Jews never talk to Samaritans. And Jewish men did not talk to women they did not know in public. And she was surprised because here I am, a Samaritan and a woman, and he's talking to me. Hey, why would you talk to me? Why, I don't understand. Why are you asking me, a woman, for a drink of water? And he said, well, if you knew who I was, you would ask me instead for a drink. And I would give you a drink of living water. Now, what's living water? Living water in Jewish thinking is water from a stream or brook or spring that's flowing, that's moving. And it tastes a lot better than stale well water. When I was a little kid, my mom and dad went to Kentucky for part of the summer. Now, my, my mom's was from Kentucky. My grandfather was a coal miner. I'll tell you more about him in a moment. And my mother grew up on a little dirt road in, in, a, in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. And uh, my grandmother's house was one bedroom and a path. The path was down to the outhouse. <laughs> hey, come on, it's all right, don't we? So one bedroom and a path, and uh, we didn't like going there because it was, it was, we were city people, you know. And she had a well. And I would go to the well and pull the rope, and I'd pull the bucket up, and in the bucket was a dipper, and I'd pull a dipper full of water out to drink it. I'd look into the dipper, and I saw lots of little things floating around, and it bothered me a lot. <laughs> when I was in Kentucky during the summer, I drank lots of Mountain Dews. So that water didn't taste very good. And I know what it's like, you know, to go down to a well in the middle of a town and pull out the, the bucket of water, and it's... There's a stale, dank taste to it, but that's all the water she had. And then Jesus says, I'm going to offer you living water. And right away, just like with Nicodemus, who did not understand what Jesus meant by born again, he thought physically, physical re uh, rebirth. She thinks it's real water he's offering me. She doesn't see that this is one of the signs. Remember the signs? Something that happens in reality that points to a deeper spiritual reality. So she thinks he's offering her real water when really he's offering her a, a spiritual source of strength. 
that once she drinks of it, it will well up in her into an inexhaustible source. It's eternal life. That's what he's offering her. And she doesn't understand, and she doesn't see it. But once you drink of this water, it will quench your thirst, and spiritually you'll never be thirsty again. Listen, I don't know your sin. I don't know what it is. But I could tell you this, whatever your sin is, it will not sustain you. It will not take care of you. It will not fill your needs, whatever your great needs are. It won't. I think our Lord is referring to, or maybe this is a prophecy about our Lord and what he would do. I think he's thinking about Isaiah chapter 55. And I want you to, to hear what Isaiah wrote, the great prophet. Come all, isn't that word all? Come all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest affair. Seek the Lord. Are you listening? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. I think Jesus is thinking about this, or maybe the prophet's pointing to it, a time when the Messiah would come and give us sustenance without anything that we earn ourselves. We don't pay for it. And when we seek him, he will give us all that he has to give, including his pardon for all of our sins. When you drink this water that Jesus has to give, it will well up into you to have eternal life. And you will be stained, sustained for the rest of your life into eternity. Drink this living water. Now, I told you about my grandfather just a, minute, a, bit, just a moment ago, ago and uh, I didn't tell you the whole story. He died when I was six months old. He was 51. He died of black lung. Now, in the mines, there was a very fine dust. This is long before they gave respirators to the miners, and he would breathe that dust in, and it destroyed his lungs. So at 51, he died. Never got a chance to know him. Then years later, about 30 years later, the government worked out a deal to give the survivors of, of uh, miners' deaths, or maybe if a, if a miner was still alive but had been injured by black lung, they would give them the settlement. And my, my grandmother got... Uh, a big settlement, a few hundred thousand dollars. And you would think that she would leave that little house, one bedroom and a path, and go out and build a house somewhere. But see, she had raised her 17, yes, 17 children. <laughs> I've never figured out how she had 17 children in one bedroom. I've never have gotten this. Never have. But anyway, she raised her 17 kids there, and she, she remembered her husband. She lived there with him, and she didn't want to move. So she took the money, and she put in running water and a bathroom. So she's 77 years old. For the first time in life, she's got running water, she's got a bathroom. And she said to me, Ernie, this is so, not, so great. I go to the sink, and I turn the faucet, and out comes water. <laughs> I'm a city guy, you know. I've been doing this since I was born. Out comes water, and it tastes so good. It tastes so good this living water that Jesus can give you. So he says to the woman, I'm offering you this water that once you take of it, you'll never be thirsty again. Don't you want that water too? Don't you want to take it, drink it? Now, stop objecting to Jesus. Stop objecting. Now, I want you to notice what's happening here. I talked about this some last week. I think that sin, talking about sin, is a, a legitimate part of presenting the gospel. But almost always it's not the first thing you say when you talk to somebody about salvation. Jesus talked to the woman about things she understood, things that were common to her. She was going through it right then. She was pour, pouring water. And he, he said, well, I'm going to offer you living water. And he, he shares with her how he can give her eternal life. And then he talks to her about her sin. Hey, I'm, I'm enjoying talking to you, but go get your husband. She goes, uh-oh. <laughs> and remember I said to, you, said to you, Jesus knew this woman even before he met her? He says to her, yeah, she's had five husbands. I mean, what is this, Psycho or Hollywood? 
What's going on here? You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. And right then she's going, uh-oh, I better start pushing back. This is getting too close to who I am. She says, okay, uh, Jesus, uh, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, you know, we Jews worship in Mount Gerizim, and you worship there in Jerusalem. Which is the right place to worship? Now, I want you to hear this. When people are told the gospel, the most common objection they make is this. There are all kinds of religions in the world. Which is the right one? How can I be sure yours is the right one? Or they may say, there's all kinds of denominations. There are, there are Catholics and Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists and I don't know what all. All kinds of denominations. Which is the right one? How can you say you Baptists are right? And Jesus said, listen, a time is coming when you will not worship on Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to hear what he said. He said, your question doesn't matter. Are you listening to me? Your question doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what denomination you are. What, the matter, what matters is that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ where you have had his precious blood, wash your sins, and give you this drink of living water that will never run dry. That's what really matters. Our Lord said, so the time is coming. We won't worship on Gerizim. We won't worship in Jerusalem. Uh, those who are true will worship in spirit and in truth. Same thing he said to Nicodemus. Same thing he said to this woman. You'll be cleansed by, the, by my blood, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit, and you'll, you'll have believed the gospel. And because you have a living relationship with God through the Spirit, and you know the truth of the gospel, then you'll be right with God. God. Now I have a little footnote here, okay? You ready for the footnote? I gotta hurry up. <laughs> it's, I got seven minutes. Footnote is this. A few chapters earlier, remember Jesus went in and cleaned the temple out of the, of the hypocrites who were selling, making money off of religion. And it, it said as a commentary on that, zeal for my father's house, you know, devotion for my father's house burns in me like a fire. Mark adds to that in Mark chapter 11. And uh, he says in commentary that, you have, that, that, that my father's house is to be a house of prayer for all the nations, and you made it into a den of thieves. The, the purpose of God's church is to be a place for all the people of the world to come. Now, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but I want you to hear this. The church gathers. The people of God gather on Sunday morning, but Sunday morning is not the church. It includes the church, but it's not the church. Any church that really cares about people, any church that is, believes in the living water and the rebirth experience, we are working to bring people in who don't yet know Jesus, who are looking for the answers so they can find him. There are churches that think of themselves as clubs, and they have very strict rules and regulations. And if you come on Sunday morning and you don't measure up, you're not welcome. And that's not this place. That's not this people. We want you here. This is a house of prayer for all the nations. Jesus is saying that true worship is spirit and truth and not rules and regulations and laws. We want you here. So when you hear the gospel, it's time to stop objecting. Now, this has happened to me so many times with different things. It could be a receipt I drop on the ground or a dollar bill or a $20 bill. I drop on the ground, but I know when I play golf, the wind is blowing and my hat blows off. I always wear a hat, as if it does me any good because they keep on cutting skin cancers off and I got a little spot right here that cut off, but it wasn't the cancer, I'm so lucky here this time. But anyway, you know, my hat blows off and I, I walk up to it and reach down. Has this happened to you? And as soon as my hand, it's like it knows. My hand gets like an inch away. <laughs> Wind blows away again. And you, I have been on the golf course running like this down the fairway, <laughs> trying to get my hat as it goes away. And pretty soon you recognize that everybody is looking at you, and you feel very embarrassed. And I feel that way about people who make objections. You know, as soon as the hand of the Lord gets closed, <laughs> Jesus keeps chasing you because of your objections. Stop making objections because this wonderful man, God in the flesh, came for you.
that you could have a taste of the living water. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for Jesus and his mustness, his had to, and how he had to come for us. We accept it. We recognize our sin will never sustain us, but that Jesus always will give his life. And I pray for those people now here in this place, or those watching from the West Portsmouth campus, those watching online right now, wherever you are, I pray for them that they can believe at this moment no more objections. If you're that person, will you pray this prayer with me? Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. And I pray I might believe in Jesus right now and taste that living water. And will you come inside of me by the power of the Spirit that I might have life and have it every day, have a living relationship with you. That's my prayer. If you prayed that prayer and you prayed it from the bottom of your heart and you meant it with all your heart, welcome to God's family. Let me know with the card you find in the, in the chair or with the form attached to the worship program. If you're watching online, you can talk to our online counselor. They're there waiting for you. I pray right now you'll receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord and leave this place or leave wherever you are knowing that you now have tasted the living water. That's our prayer we make, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, and follow us on social media so you don't miss any future DC Church content.